<clears throat> Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 836. Seven. Hold on, I didn't check. <laughs> One second. <laughs> Seven. There you go. Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 300. <laughs> We're out of practice, George. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got an audience back there, too. That's great. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 837. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 10th, 2024. All right, welcome back from Christmas break. George and I are here to do some entertaining, some information uh, gathering and tell you what we think about what's going on out there. Uh, but we're out of practice, okay? We've not done this since uh, like the second or third week of December. We're going to make some bloopers and some errors and say things that are strange. And that's because we just you know, took some time off. George had to do about four million services over the Christmas week. Uh, to, to keep his church happy. And uh, we'll probably tell you this, uh, he's taking on another church for a little while too in the local area. So he's going to be even more busier, but he's agreed to continue on with Unscripted. We really appreciate that very much. Uh, George, how was your Christmas? Very busy. And Christmas break for me really hasn't occurred yet. <laughs> yeah. We've uh, <laughs> lots of activities, lots of fun. Uh, interesting, the... Uh, attendance on for for this is inside insiders baseball yeah. but having christmas day on a sunday on a monday really plays havoc with your schedule because people should go sunday morning and right. then christmas day mm -hmm. or christmas eve service later that day and it's not the good old days when everybody does that so we uh i don't want to say thinner because everybody showed up across the two days but uh, not everybody came uh, to christmas and not everybody came to sunday uh, you know oh this my. this year was a little different because you know christmas eve was on the sunday and uh it made things a little more difficult for sure our church did not have services in the morning on christmas eve but we had the christmas services at like a, a four o'clock and six o'clock and mm -hmm. all the kids were at the four o'clock Jill and I had a nice quiet service at six o'clock, so uh, it worked as well. It, it worked its way out. Uh, yeah, Christmas here was really good. Um, but George, uh, we've had some storms here recently, like yesterday. Yeah, we had uh, tornado winds pass through a big storm front. Nothing like with the people having up north with the snow yeah. and the rain. But as you can see, I have my wool <laughs> suit on. It was in the fifties when I got up this morning. So I have my parka, my wool suit, the heater's on full blast in the office. Uh, so it's a nice, toasty 78 degrees in here. Cool. See, I, I like, I, I, I'm like. i never happier than when it's the summer in Florida. 100% humidity, 95 degrees. <laughs> All right. Uh, your dear wife posted on Facebook that you got a new dog. Yes, indeed. We got a, uh, I'm having a midlife crisis. A little late, but I'm still having a midlife crisis, but... Uh, my wife wouldn't let me get a motorcycle, so we got another Cavalier. We got a female, a tricolor, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very, very happy. She fits right into the pack. Cool. Right. And, and, you know, God be praised. We're dog people. And, uh, and in two weeks' time, we're having our St. Anthony of the Great Festival. I'm in the local newspaper today with me patting a horse on its uh, forelock. <laughs> yes, uh, where uh, we have the blessings of animals and we have uh, bounce houses and barbecues and all the sort of, you know, small town church fairs things uh, that take place. And plus me blessing sheep, goats, dogs, cats, horses, and whatnot. Well, you can only Four bless maybe. Hmm? domesticated animals because of, uh, you know, this isn't Francis. 
It's right. Francis St. Francis in October. Most right. Episcopal churches started doing that in October because <clears throat> Francis is the patron saint of all animals. Right. Well, St. Anthony of Egypt or St. Anthony the Great, which is not Anthony of Padua, mind you. No. His his feast on uh, on the uh, it's next Wednesday, but we move it to Saturday. Uh, he is the patron saint of domestic animals. Mm-hmm. So that's livestock, and so we've got the 4-H coming with little lambs and pigs. And, you know, one of our uh, members w- said, you know, when he was a kid, they used to have a grease pig contest where you'd get a little pen and you'd get a, uh, a pig and you'd cover it with uh, Crisco or something, yeah. and then you'd whoever could catch it. And evidently, that is now considered animal cruelty. So we're not having a greased pig contest this year. Instead, we're going to have Fred. We're going to get him all greased up and see if we can catch Fred. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. So we had a great Christmas here. You had a great Christmas there. Uh, although we're in the same state, let's move on to the news. That's what people come here to watch. Although before we get started too far, please like this episode. We need to have more likes because we've had no likes now for about three weeks and need to reinvigorate the uh, YouTube and Facebook algorithms. Uh, please share this episode with family, friends, and foe. And if you're not subscribed yet, please click on that red rectangle. A bell will pop up. You click the bell. You will be instantly notified every time Kevin clicks the publish button on our next episode of Anglican Unscripted. George, I saw that Fort Worth issued a statement uh, right before the bishops meeting here with the ACNA, but right after the Pope Francis controversy that uh, that brought us into the Christmas season, George. Yes, for the Standing Committee of Fort Worth re- released a statement entitled Standing Committee Resolutions on Women's Orders and Same-Sex Blessings. And Fort Worth restated its longstanding uh, opposition to the ordination of women. And they said they were motivated to make this statement because Central Africa, one of the uh, few provinces that does not ordain women, recently at their uh, synod has agreed to allow dioceses the local option of ordaining women. Mm-hmm. Now, what that means is, say, for instance, Malawi will not ordain women, but Zimbabwe uh, and Zambia or Botswana may, uh, because it's multinational province. They also voted to split into provinces of Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, three different provinces. So once things settle out, you'll still have some provinces that don't ordain women. But they believe at Fort Worth, that the ordination of women is a first order issue because it affects the validity of the sacraments and the grace that is bestowed in the sacraments. Uh, If the ordination of a woman and the blessing of same-sex unions are innovations they feel that the church cannot make unless the church acts in concert and unison as a Catholic small c church. So not only the living in love and faith, living in love love and faith prayers coming out of England uh, is causing them heart failure uh, because that's the Anglican side and the women's issue out of Central Africa. But I think this is unstated, but Pope Francis is, uh, oh, fuzziness. (laughs) Fuzziness. And, you know, blessings of gay unions, gay couples, is basically saying to Fort Worth, this is a line we're not going to cross. Mm-hmm. Now, it is coincidental that this summer, the ACNA elects a new primate, and this week, as Kevin mentioned, the ACNA bishops are meeting down here in Florida. So perhaps, and also this past year has seen a lot of squirrely stuff in one or two corners of the ACNA, uh, some uh, church, of the, church of the Diocese of Saving Others, uh, yeah. for Serving Others, so, C4SO. So, yep. Who, by the way, just got a one in a million quarter dollar grant for the Lilly Foundation. So they're now flush with money to continue being squirrely. Uh, well, so I've, the, seen, uh, I've seen less squirrely lists in the last uh, um, couple months. But uh, if you listen to a certain podcast by a certain bishop, he's having people on that podcast that uh, uh, are not fully orthodox or vetted, to be sure. So and now they got money not to be fully orthodox. <laughs> you know, money makes the world go round. Oh, you can have the best doctrine in the world, but if you don't have two pennies to rub together, you can't get it out there. It's hard but to. But now, yeah, now that they've been rewarded this Lilly grant, 
yeah. along with uh, four Episcopal dioceses, Vermont, uh, Albany, I think Iowa and somebody else, uh, have all gotten money from the Lilly Foundation to uh, do uh, evangelism and ministry. Yeah, I, I want to do a quick local story here. Um, if people don't know, uh, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church is Michael Curry, and his health has not been good, uh, at least for the last two years. And, you know, I do want to you know, be sure that my audience here lifts him up in prayer. You know, that's one of the things we're called to do for. And uh, um, it, I don't see any good news coming out about his health. And uh, I'm wondering how long he can stay in office. Michael Curry's term ends this summer as well at the uh, next general convention of the Episcopal Church. And he has had poor health. You know, it started a year or so ago with prostate problems and heart mm -hmm. problems, then a number of surgeries. And recently he had an emergency surgery for an aneurysm. He's out of intensive care. We're getting weak. We're getting almost daily bulletins from the national church office, but uh, his health is poor. Um, nobody expects him to die tomorrow, but he's not the vigorous, uh, energetic, lively fellow that he was at the start of his term of office. Sure. So I'll pray for him as he, yeah. for, to recover his health and, uh, and strength. Okay. Uh, boy, you, you give me a whole bunch of stories here. Uh, one of the interesting stories, uh, we've covered this uh, in detail on Anglican Unscripted with interviewing uh, David Pelleggi, and uh, you and I have talked about the, the war in the Middle East um, many times is what is the ultimate solution we've tried to propose a two-state solution um, we've tried negotiations we've tried uh, putting billions of funds into the gaza strip in the west bank and none of that has worked because it's a culture of hate uh, they teach their children to hate uh, they teach their their children that uh, the only enemy they have is israel and there must be a, a solution other than hate. And you uh, pointed me to an article about a uh, uh, Arafat supporter who has turned to Christ in the Gaza Strip. And he says the only solution, the only solution to the conflict in uh, Israel is Christ. Absolutely. That uh, a fellow named uh, Tas Abu Saada appeared on uh, the Trinity Broadcasting Network on the Rosenberg Report. And Sa'ada wa ha was, had been a Fatah, which is Yasser Arafat's, uh, the PLO leader, and until his conversion to Christianity in the 1990s, he had a uh, spiritual awakening, and independently, his wife and his adult son did too, and all three came to Christ. And Rose and what Saada said is that the people in Hamas are basically been trained for a generation that the purpose of their lives is to hate and destroy Israel. And the hopelessness that now pervades Palestinian society uh, is finding an outlet in mass conversions to Christianity. Now, Hamas persecutes Christians in Gaza and on the West Bank. Uh, Bethlehem used to be majority Christian. Uh, when it was under Ottoman, then Israeli, yeah. and uh, the control. But since it's been under uh, control of the Fatah or the PLO, the Christians have been driven out. Now uh, they're going to move to Israel, they move, or they emigrate, where it's it's now less than 15% Christian Bethlehem, where it had been majority Christian. And what's happening is, you know, a, a, it's like mafia rule. Uh, you either pay protection or you get burned out of your house and somebody takes your house and there's no and there's no police, no justice. And what Saada said is that the ideology of Adas, of uh, Hamas, in the Gaza Strip is just hate Jews. And once we destroy the Jew, we will be reach perfection. And this war in Gaza has basically told them that's not true. And Saada basically is saying that the God can be found at work right now in Gaza, converting the hearts of the people there. For um, he says, you know, there is never going to be a two-state solution uh, where you have one where you have Israel and then a country next to Israel that wants to destroy Israel. 
you can only have a godly solution. And that can only come through Jesus Christ converting the hearts of the people of Hamas and in Palestine who wish to destroy Israel to work, recognize and welcome the one true God. Now, this guy, he said, you know, he was a member of Fatah. He, you know, has all his grievances against Israel being, uh, you know, all this and that. And he says, you know, at a certain point, you have to stop and say, you know, what did Jesus say? Love your enemy. Uh, and uh, love the Lord and don't live on hatred. Yeah. So it's quite extraordinary, quite a powerful testimony. And one that we really do not see offered in these talking heads or from these uh, uh, religious leaders in the Middle East. You know, Christ well, really is the only answer. Absolutely. And it's transformational. Uh, the only solution for a region like uh, the Middle East would certainly be to restore themselves through Christ. Um, I, it's a long road, and it, it, it's maybe not something that we'd see in my lifetime, but what a great thing to pray for and to hope for. Let's uh, talk about some other news you've... Oh, well, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, if if I'm at a regular Episcopal service or uh, an ACNA service, when it comes to the Eucharist, the priest will say, this is for all baptized believers. Um, uh, it doesn't matter your denomination. You can come forward and receive the bread and wine. That happens at my church. I'm sure that happens at your church. Uh, it used to be, in some uh, provinces, you had to be confirmed as well. And the West Indies was one of the holdouts for confirmation to receive the Eucharist. They're changing their mind, or they're just putting papers out? What, what's going on? I'm a priest of the Episcopal Church, but I also hold a license of the Church of the West Indies, yeah. where I've served uh, um, as a vacation interim. And so I hold a license from the Bishop of uh, and uh, Northeast Caribbean and Antigua. And I got a circular uh, saying that effective the first Sunday in Advent, confirmation is no longer a prerequisite, prerequisite for receiving Holy Communion. Now, that had been the process, the, the, not the process, that had been the policy of Anglicanism basically all around the world until the 70s, 80s, 90s. I certainly, as a child, I did not go, I did not receive communion because I wasn't confirmed. Uh, starting with the prayer book revision in the 70s and going forward in the Episcopal Church, certainly, but also in the Church of England and other churches, it changed because the new liturgical thinking was that baptism is the full initiation to Christianity. And we still don't know what confirmation is for other than to give the, the bishop something to do. Well, the West Indies held out against this. The West Indies basically <clears throat> said, no, you have to be confirmed. You cannot receive unless you're confirmed in the Episcopal Church. Well, the bishops in the West Indies have been studying this issue for five years, sending out, comp sending out studies, sending out things to congregations, explaining their thinking, they were going to do doctrinal change, liturgical change, but they were going to do it in good order. So it took several years, announced why they were doing this, which was their belief that baptism is full initiation into Christian life and family. And essentially said, no, they didn't say it in these words, but we really don't know what confirmation is for, but we're still going to keep it sort of as a uh, finishing off of the project, but the project's already been completed with baptism. So now when you go to the West Indies, or when I go to the West Indies to serve at the altar, I can now say all baptized Christians are welcome to receive communion at this altar, because that's now the policy of the West Indies. They have amended their canons, they've amended the Constitution, and uh, they haven't reprinted the prayer book, but I think it'll... Uh, at a certain point, uh, when they've got the money to reprint them all, they'll put that in there too. Well, is confirmation not confirming your baptism and your faith before the bishop? Uh, yes, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, well, what does it matter? Because it's before God, not the bishop. And if, if you're already, you know, <laughs> if the Holy Spirit's implanted into your heart and that is symbolized by the rite of baptism, you know, basically giving the bishop something to do at confirmation? Or is it that everybody's baptized a Christian and you're confirmed as an Episcopalian or Methodist or Catholic 
is confirmation just a denominational thing? And the work really hasn't been done, at least to my satisfaction. I'm sure people have done this work, but it just hasn't trickled down to the peasants like me. What we need to do about it. And so there you go. Uh, we've got... Uh, uh, I don't We've think got that... a proper evolution of change, if you will, in the West Indies, where they yeah. basically, instead of just one day by a vote of 50% plus one, uh, deciding, oh, we'll now bless gay unions. Oh, we'll now do this, that, 50% plus one. They really spend the time and argue it out to death and essentially say, you know, what do we understand by... The real work was what do we understand happens at baptism, not so much at confirmation, but is baptism isn't sufficient in and of itself the answer sure. is yes well here's the cool thing they took on you know a rather oblique doctrine and they were not forced by uh the church of england or the canadians or the americans to adopt uh the standard quo they did this in their their, their own nobody was forcing them to do it they took the time five years to study it uh, nobody was withholding money. Nobody says, you, uh, we're, we're not going to let your government trade because you have this strange doctrine. Um, th they, they took it on their own accord to look into it and said, you know, we we can see why the rest of the world does baptism only for the Eucharist. So, cool. Well, there was, there was a push in some quarters <clears throat> in the West Indies to, to adopt the Orthodox practice of baptizing and confirming at the same time. Mm -hmm which the, some of the Orthodox group do with children. But the Anglo-Catholic tradition is so very strong in the West Indies that they still love the, uh, the uh, dressing up little girls and boys in white outfits yeah, yeah. And, you know, when they're 11 or 12 and do that. So culturally, we won't see much of a change. This is more adopted to adult converts coming into the faith uh, from different denominations who may not be confirmed as Pentecostals or this or that. All right, moving on in the news, the mighty, the once mighty nation of Nigeria is uh, allowing Christians to be massacred. And uh, we saw this right before Christmas in some news releases. And uh, it's, it's, is this the next Rwanda? I am trying to, to figure out what's happening here. Are we going to have a division of Nigeria? in a year or two, like we saw in, in Sudan. Um, it, it's really a mess right now, George. It's a slow motion genocide. 250 people were murdered on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the Plateau State and in northern Nigeria. And there have been 10 to 12 people each day being Christians, being murdered by Fulani Muslim tribesmen and gunmen and Boko Haram and terrorist groups. And the government's really not doing anything effectively to stop this. There are conspiracy beliefs that the government, certain government leaders and certain generals are colluding with the uh, extremists to uh, allow this to continue. Some are saying the army wants things to fall apart so badly that the army steps in and rules again, as it did in the past. Mm -hmm. Others are saying that the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> The Nigerian president of uh, has put his people into office to basically allow Nigerian Muslims to get away with murder. The uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom voted uh, to recommend the State Department designate Nigeria as a country of particular concern or for the persecution of Christians. And the Biden administration, to the shock of basically everybody, uh, it, involved in this issue said, no, Nigeria is just fine. Thank you very much. And so we've got some political shenanigans going on where the Biden administration doesn't want to offend, I don't know, the organization of Islamic states or somebody or other, but we're soft peddling is the Islamic persecution of Christians in Nigeria. And uh, it's a pretty bad situation. But uh, at the same time, yeah. we have to remember at the same time, we are standing firm and strong on the gay issue. President Biden issued a proclamation on December 29th, removing Uganda's favorite trade status. There's a uh, trade pact with African, less developed African nations that allows them to ship to the United States about 3,000 different products. Duty free. Yep. Duty free. 
you know, to help small businesses in agriculture in this part of the world. The United States, however, reserves the right to uh, monitor these countries' human rights and political uh, situation, and if they don't like it, we can stop it. So Obama administration killed it for four states. Two of them had military coups, and we wanted to punish the governments for their military coups. One of them is the Central African Republic. They're, they're getting pally with the Russians. And the, the Wagner Group is now basically the de facto army of the Central African Republic, which has all these diamond mines. And the third is Uganda, which the uh, President Biden has condemned the anti-sodomy laws of Uganda. Uh, and uh, basically said, you know, it's abhorrent. So it's okay. Things are fine in Nigeria where daily dozens of Christians are murdered. But a law that has never been enforced that might execute a gay man might someday in the future hasn't happened in 50 years won't happen for 50 years that's enough to uh basically uh try to hurt the ugandan economy our government folks yep our government canadian government most of the uk government yep all right british, uh, british <laughs> the brits let's see here going through the notes here um I'm still seeing this, but let's talk about uh, the Pope Francis fallout. Um, Pope Francis, if if you have been under a rock uh, the last four weeks, you need to know that Pope Francis issued a, whatever that's called that the Romans do, and uh, said, listen, I'm going to change the practice, but not the doctrine of how we bless people in same-sex unions. I'm I'm... I'm com compressing a lot of stuff into that one statement. And uh, the fallout has been amazing, George. Uh, uh, nobody in the Roman Catholic Church does not have an opinion on this. This has been compared to 1968 and Humanae Vitae, the uh, papal uh, encyclical on contraception. Sure. But in 68, it was the liberals who were horrified, the liberals who said, no, the, the Vatican's made a terrible mistake. This time around, it's the traditionalists, the conservatives who have said the, the statement by the Vatican blessing gay couples as a pastoral practice. That is an abomination. And unlike Humanae Vitae, where there was considerable talk, but no action by groups and people, the Episcopal Conferences, which are the national bish dioceses in Africa, um, have all, and in Africa and in Asia and Eastern Europe and South America and the Pacific have rejected, not, uh, not voiced private or personal observations, but the whole, all the churches of Zambia, all of the Catholic dioceses of Malawi, the Catholic bishops of Hungary, have rejected this doctrine and called it a false teaching. Now to supporters of the Pope and some people who will support the Catholic Church come hell or high water have said, nothing has changed. Right. The doctrine has changed. It's just the pastoral practice has changed. Well, the response and somebody like Cardinal Sarah who, and, uh, or Cardinal Muller, the former head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the office that under uh, Cardinal Fernandez put out this new teaching as basically saying when you change practical pastoral and uh, pastoral teaching you change doctrine you know we're a church that prayers shape our believing Lex Arande, Lex Prevente, just like yep. the Anglicans and so the the, the 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 fraud that the Anglicans try to get away with the Church of England where we're we're not changing doctrine we're only changing the practice that doesn't fly logically, theologically, or in the sight and eyes of God. So Catholic, in the Catholic world, <clears throat> it's been pretty bad in the Anglican world for the for a generation because we've had this same exact issue. But it's been bad, but the Roman Catholic Church used to condemn what the Anglicans were doing. Right. And now, now, they, they, now they join it. Yeah. Yeah. And... But for the Anglicans, just because the Archbishop of Canterbury has gone round the bend, 
or because the presiding bishop in the general convention has gone around the bend, we have enough, basically, lack of magisterium looseness that I can say here in Hooterville, Florida, well, forget you, you're wrong. And nobody can say that I'm not a good Episcopalian. Whereas when the Vatican says this is the way it is, you don't have that luxury in the Catholic Church. The central here's here's the joke of it. Vatican II was about decentralizing. Right. And the liberals <clears throat> are over centralizing the in things and they're in the Vatican under the new regime, and then they're skipping the bishops, saying you you priests now have the authority to do this. You know, and the bishops, you know, can't stand in your way. Um, well, people will say, oh, well, you know, it's still the catechism's the same, this or that. I said, well, when you've got Father James Martin, the American Jesuit, the day after um, blessing gay couples, you've got Catholic priests on Facebook every day, it seems, wearing yeah. their stoles, blessing gay couples. Hmm. Don't tell me this isn't a change. Well, you know, and don't tell me it doesn't affect anything because, uh, hey, it's the Pope. This doesn't affect anything. We can do what we want in our uh, Catholic uh, parishes. I'm like, really? Try and do a traditional uh, Latin Mass. You know, what comes from the Vatican is uh, a magisterium on high. And uh, they have the ability to force it. Now, I did see the Vatican condemn uh, the blessing of two lesbians. Well, it, it, you can only do homosexual men? I mean, I, I, I don't get what's going on here, George. Well, I don't think anybody does. But Robert George, Robert P. George, who's a very well-known American Catholic intellectual, he's a public intellectual, we don't have many these days, he said, just need to think about it. What if uh, Herod and Herodias went to John the Baptist and asked for a blessing? Now, they've uh, divorced their spouses to marry their brother's wife <laughs> and violated all these Jewish laws, but their hearts are in the right place. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist, if he were a good Catholic priest under this Pope's new uh, rules, Robert P. George is saying, would bless that aspect of their horrible relationship that is godly. Now, how do you now how does that work? I mean, you know, John the Baptist rightly condemned what they were doing is against God and nature. Uh, and it's and the thing is, this uh, shift is so sudden. In the uh, pastoral document on the care of homosexuals, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, I don't know if he was Pope Benedict at the time, said that not to tell the truth to people, to lie to them, to make them feel good, these are George's paraphrasing, is a terrible thing because you're denying them the truth of God's word by basically trying to uh, curry favor with them instead of teach them the unchanging truths of scripture and you know the bible and the traditions of the church and this is what francis is doing and the uh it may very well be that this december was a 19th statement will be seen as the most radical biggest church news thing uh in, of the century um I know. Scripture is profitable for doctrine. And uh, apparently that's uh, been lost on the last uh, three or four generations of the church. If you look, just as a church political aside, mm -hmm. a lot of these new cardinals are from that Pope Francis has been promoting are from what they call the periphery, ones from Mongolia and Asia and this and that. Yep. And none of these guys are following Francis on the gay stuff. This is a step too far. So I don't think we're going to necessarily see someone when Francis goes, because he's not doing too well either, health wise. I don't see we'll see I don't think we'll see a Francis clone, but I don't know. Okay, so let's move on to Church of England. This'll be fun. Uh it, it's right out of Monte Python, actually. Uh, Sir Galahad Welby, what I don't know, Sir Justin Welby has uh, uh, received knighthood from King Charles. And uh, there's an interesting story that I, I hope George will tell about the uh, other person who was knighted as well. Uh, but I don't see anything wrong with knighting a archbishop. 
it, it's better than uh you know uh chasing them around uh lambeth and and executing them right well when they retire archbishops of canterbury are usually given a peerage mm-hmm. george carey ron williams so yeah. and so forth, or lord carey lord williams and we would expect in the fullness of time lord welby but at this new year's honors list uh, king charles uh made justin welby a knight commander of the victorian order now that is a particular uh order of knighthood that is within the preserve of the crown it's usually given to courtiers of the king or for personal services to the king i believe richard charters the former bishop of london had received an honor of this sort he did yeah so welby is getting a an award from charles for something charles is happy that welby has done and there was a, a, a rather amusing article in the newspaper the other day about two men in their late 60s were given peerages and both of them run organizations that are all across england all of them have been in office about the same time except one of them the church of england has fallen in half <clears throat> in terms of attendance since the year 2000. that's the next and story <laughs> well these uh Welby has presided over the greatest collapse of the Church of England since, gosh, I don't know when. While this other fellow, who runs a chain of pubs called Weatherspoons, has uh, seen remarkable growth. And the, uh, the, the fellow says, you know, the beer baron is given a knighthood because he has established a chain of pubs all around England, different names, but same menu, same food same standard of service you're not going to go there for craft beers you're not going to go there for gourmet food you're going to go you know what you're going to get consistency. and you get what you pay for yeah. consistency and it's a formula for success whereas if Welby and the church of england had only practiced the weatherspoons <laughs> business model they might not be in such a horrendous state i thought that was quite an amusing way to describe it and the other thing is is well we're going to have to hand this back after all the uh abuse allegations with uh, Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe come out what did Welby know and when did he know it what did he do and what did he hide and all this and that what did King Charles know King Charles was also a good friend of George Ball and so Peter Ball, Peter Peter Ball, Ball the, sorry uh, Bishop Ball the, and so the Bishop what, Ball the pervert yeah I mean uh, I don't know it's a crazy story uh, I don't mind it so much uh, what they do in England as long as what they do in England stays in England I'm okay with that uh, but there's a lot of uh, news we need to talk about with the Church of England. Uh, poll and studies have shown that the Church of England has lost half of its attendance since 2000. Yeah, 2000 average Sunday attendance was 950,000. 2022 was 549. It's almost half. Mm-hmm. And, under, and since COVID, every diocese, 2019 to 2022, every diocese has lost a fifth to a quarter of its uh, attendance and the decline covid didn't cause the decline covid sped up the decline you know, some dioceses like manchester have lost 60 percent of their attendance since 1990 um others like london and ely haven't done as bad london in fact did well under charters it didn't fall and people were asking well what's different about london but now london is declining under Sarah Mullally. She's with, she's overseeing the decline of the Church of England. But there was an article we republished by men and David Goodhue saying what is really frightening for the Church of England is that the, the absence of children. A uh, number of children in church from 2019 to 2022 declined by 23 percent. And for example, in Canterbury Diocese, there were 1,600 children in Sunday school in 2019. In 2022, it was down to a thousand. That's a 40% drop. And you know, Hereford, the Diocese of Hereford has 399 churches. They had 400 children in churches in 2022. That's a child per church. Mm-hmm. That this is no longer a sustainable organization. This is not just a nosedive. This is a death roll, a death spiral when you've got one child per church in your diocese diocese man crazy all right uh we didn't really have reason to cover this before uh but it now has a nice anglican angle thanks to some newspaper reporting 
Uh, let's talk about the UK post office scandal. The UK post office uh, uh, used a software that was errant. And uh, it would uh, say that this post office has been uh, uh, taking money and the postmaster general clearly is in charge of it. And they would prosecute hundreds of postmasters over the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, when I say hundreds, I guess it's like five to seven hundred, maybe seven hundred. Seven hundred people were prosecuted for theft uh, due Nuzzled. to a due to a software error. Now this is a problem, off, obviously, with the leadership of the post office, but also with the UK government, because the post office uh, would prosecute these people and show that the money was missing in the software, but they could not show that the postmaster had taken the money into any of their accounts, uh, which. You know, you, you kind of do have to do that here in America. Uh, you have to prove where the money went uh, to be prosecuted. Uh, so, George, this has now an Anglican angle, and uh, we should talk about this because uh, the head of the postmaster uh, in UK was almost a bishop. Whoa. Paula Venels was the CEO of the post office, and... Uh, mm -hmm. She joined the post office from L'Oreal in 2007 and resigned in 2019. And she was a high-flying executive type. She was also a part-time, non-spendery clergy person, clergy woman of the Church of England, ministering in the Diocese of St. Albans. And so she had her day job at the post office, running the post office, overseeing this scandal of... Uh, postmasters and postmistresses being accused of theft and prosecuted and the problem was faulty software and it actually became evident that the higher-ups in the post office knew that there wasn't theft at a certain point they knew they had they figured it out they, they f yeah but they didn't stop the juggernaut crushing these poor little small when i say postmasters and postmistresses in england they have you know we have them in small towns so uh sell newspapers, gum, cigarettes, stamps, mm -hmm. and you can drop off packages. And uh, these people running these little independent stores were being accused of theft because their books weren't balancing based on the software that the post office introduced. And Paula Venels was in charge of the post office and she oversaw this uh, prosecution campaign. Well, in 2016, she led the bishop's management training courses, how to be a good executive. And in 2017, when they did the consultation for the Bishop of London, the BBC reports that she was one of three candidates, Sarah Mullally, who became the Bishop of London, and Paula Venels. We don't know who the third was. Venels had never been a parish priest, had never been a bishop, had never been a parish rector. She had Sunday part-time experience. But the BBC claims that Justin Welby was pushing her candidacy to be Bishop of London because of her management expertise. So the whole management model of Bishop is encapsulated in this person. And now uh, it, the story has come out because uh, ITV ran a uh, dramatized story about how some Several postmasters' lives were ruined. They were bankrupted and some were jailed because of the unthinking and unblinking arrogance of the administrators of the post office. And in many ways, this story is the story of the Church of England. In some ways, she should have become the Bishop of London because then the story would have been perfectly scripted. But the Crown Nomination Commission plumped on the nurse rather than the postmistress. Well, I mean, the Church of England has been uh, persecuting and uh, uh, prosecuting Orthodox Christians for quite a while now. And so it, it makes sense that the middle management uh, in the C of E is doing what the post office did. Yeah, and there's a trend in the Episcopacy, certainly in the Episcopal Church these days, but also in the Church of England to promote people who I would not say are qualified in the least to be bishops because they have no real pastoral experience running parishes. They're on committees, they're assistants, they have, you know, academic jobs. They have 
anything but real frontline experience with people in the pews. And so these second career types uh, who are you know, ordained in their 40s or late 50 or 50s, who have five, six years experience become bishops based not on their, their ministerial <clears throat> experience, but because based on what they did before they became uh, a bishop. You know, Sarah Mullally became a bishop, an assistant bishop, only because she had, was the chief nurse of the British Health Service, and not because of her academic rigor, her thinking, her charism of ministry, her leadership of episcopacy, but because she was a good administrator. And if you ask me, is there a correlation between the Church of England's Sunday attendance falling in half? and the promotion of bishops like Sarah Mullally or possibly Paula Venels. I won't say the causation is there, uh, but the correlation, the correlation is pretty is, clear. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you really want to look back on the day of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were middle management. And now we have them in charge of the Church of England. Joy, what could go wrong? All right, uh, is that it on the list here? George, we got all nine yeah. items. Cool. That's not bad at all. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 837 of Anglican Unscripted.